I want to talk about the Canon SL2, a camera I didn't think Canon was going to make. Canon has a huge lineup of entry-level or beginner DSLRs now, and as they redesigned that T6i, T6s line and emphasized the smaller, I thought they had squeezed out the SL2. I didn't think there was going to be a successor to the SL1 because its really main selling point was their smallest DSLR, in fact, the smallest DSLR on the market from any manufacturer. But they did release an SL2. And we'll come back and talk a little bit about its size in a minute. But we've got this big lineup from the T6 to the SL2 to the T7i and the 77D. And it's important that even though this is smaller than all of those, it shouldn't be thought of as the most beginner um, or the worst because it in fact uses some of the latest technology. We've got the Bluetooth in here. We've got the Digic 7 processor, which should give us the best low light capabilities of all of those cameras. And we have a redesigned 18 to 55 lens. So all of those things together equals a very small DSLR that should be just as capable with a few sacrifices as some of those larger ones. Now, one of the things that I wanna talk about in general with Canon while we're still here in the studio is the lens selection. I mean, that is a huge strength over pretty much any of the other manufacturers. Canon's been around for a long time, making a lot of fantastic lenses. And as a result, we've got a handful of really great budget-friendly lenses from wide angles to primes to even a telephoto lens that all come in at about that $200 mark. And if you're looking at picking up a camera and you want that kind of full range of buying an interchangeable lens camera, Canon's going to be able to give it to you. Another real strength of this camera, as being one of the latest from Canon, is its redesigned user interface. It's even easier to kind of help you or guide you get those results you want. We're going to go out in the field and shoot with this a little bit, and I'll give you some feedback on that kind of redesigned menu system, whether or not I think it's so helpful. But, you know, of course, we've got to come back and mention its small size. I mean, that is the main selling point that they list at the top bullet point for the SL2. And because of that, I think it's interesting to kind of briefly compare it against something like the Sony A6000 series. This is actually the A6300, but it nicely represents both of those cameras in kind of size and weight. And this is a mirrorless and this is a traditional DSLR. So what are the pros and cons that you get when you go to a slightly smaller mirrorless camera versus a more traditional DSLR? Well, we'll touch on that in the field as well. But for now, let's get packed up and get out and go shoot. All right, so as I'm packing up to go out for the day, you know, the SL2 is nice and lightweight and small and compact. I mean, that's its real strength. And many of us have bigger full frame DSLRs. We could bring these along if we wanted to. But what I hear from many of you, and I agree, is we don't want to carry that size and weight with us every day when we're just kind of going out and about on these little trips. And the reality is so rarely are we carrying just a camera. I mean, almost always we've got all kinds of snacks and if we're parents, we've got kids, we've got other things that we want to bring along with us as well to keep everybody happy and healthy. And you just don't want a big, heavy camera. Now, when you look over at the Sony a6300 or a6000, it certainly is a little bit more compact and a tiny bit lighter. It almost feels like it could fit in a jacket pocket. With the SL2, you could throw on a prime lens and get that small and compact as well, although you give up some of the versatility. All in all, though, their weight differences are unremarkable. Let's head out and get some shots with these cameras now. All right, so one of the changes they've made from the SL1 to the SL2 is this fully articulating screen, which Canon's got pretty much on all of their APS-C DSLRs these days. And it's really, really nice. I got 
My kid's out here at the local park. We're in this kind of taller grove of trees. And this articulating screen, especially the fact that you can bring it out sideways, get down low to offer a different perspective, makes it really easy. That coupled with the fact that it's fully touch sensitive, not only for touching your and picking your focus, but also for navigating through your menus, really kind of speaks to this usability of these Canon cameras. All right, so we talked about the general usability of this camera being improved, and one feature of that is this new user interface. It's a little bit more guided and helpful. I mean, in manual mode, we see our sliders for each of the items that we can set to kind of control the look of the image, from shutter speed to aperture, and it's very easy to do. You just quickly uh, touch the Q and you can move those. We really start to see the helpfulness, though, when we move into one of the more semi auto modes like aperture priority. It's kind of showing you what you're going to get at the different f-stops with the background more blurred over here. Press the Q always helpfully and move it to the right and we can start to see that we're going to be moving towards a more sharp background and it tells you exactly that. And below that kind of helpful screen is the items that you'd want to set for general shooting. And in shutter speed priority where we're really controlling the shutter speed, you can see that it gives you a blurry subject to a very crisp frozen subject. And again, just kind of helping you get the shots that you're looking for. All right, despite its small size, I still find this camera quite comfortable to hold in the hand. The grip is nicely rounded and deep enough. It balances with a little bit longer lenses that you might throw on here. And I really love that we've got a dedicated ISO button up top. I think you should change your ISO often when you're shooting on Canon cameras. You should be very aware of that when you're shooting in full manual. And it's nice to have a dedicated button to go there. We start to get a little cramped on the back when we get to our exposure control and our kind of cue set menu that we use, the little rocker pad for navigating through all of the menu items. It doesn't really affect the shooting experience. You spend a lot more time with your hand up here and these buttons give you what you need. But I'm curious, as we head out this way and start shooting a little bit more, I mean the Sony A6000 series, which is an even smaller, lighter, does give you a little bit more customizability, but let's compare how that grip and those buttons work on the back end of that camera as well. All right, so I found this leaf at the end of a branch and it's kind of like a sign of fall trying to hang on even though we're firmly in winter here in Seattle. I'm shooting on the Sony a6300 now and you know, it's lighter. I mean, even though the SL2 is a light camera, this feels even lighter in the hand and of course it's even smaller and more compact and honestly, I feel like it could just fit in my jacket pocket. Uh, it doesn't feel as nice in the hand though. So that's, that's one of the downsides of working with an even smaller camera. There's less to grip up front and the grip is a little bit blockier and just not quite as nice in the hand. There are even more buttons back here. So we don't have the fully articulating screen, but we have more buttons, which makes it a little bit more customizable than working with the Canon. I've put this camera in the hands of beginners though, often, and, and I've taught at different workshops with the Sony and the Canon. And the Sony just doesn't have that kind of inviting user friendliness that I see on the Canon. You gotta work a little bit more to kind of figure out what you need to do. And even though there are more buttons, more of them do double duty, more than one thing at a time. And that can kind of hamper the controls sometimes because you'll end up moving one item when you really meant to do the other. So that can be tricky. But if that small lightweight form factor is critical to you, then a mirrorless has a good advantage here. So this little bit of lichen on the ground makes an interesting image. It's green on this kind of sea of dead brown leaves. And the articulating screen of the Sony certainly gets the job done. I mean, it flips up, I can see what I'm getting and the focus is capable, but I miss that touch to focus or just having the touch screen capabilities on the Canon SL2. That's a really nice feature that makes it even more usable. And of course, being fully articulated on the Canon allows me to easily capture selfies when I'm traveling, or if you wanted to make it a vlogging camera and capture some video, it's really nice and easy to see your exposure and kind of judge your composition as you're shooting. 
but a strength of the Sony is that the viewfinder and the LCD autofocus system are the same, fast and capable. That's not as true on the SL2. And so let's head off now and kind of test and compare those capabilities and the speed of autofocus and frames per second you get when shooting through those two different methods. All right, so I've been shooting my son here on the zip line a couple of times with the Canon and the Sony, and clear winner with the Sony. I mean, not only is it faster with a faster frame rate, but its focusing system through the viewfinder or on the back of the camera, the LCD, is just as capable. And that's really nice when maybe when you want to get a, a kind of portrait shot without the camera up to your eye or you want to shoot over the, a crowd of people in front of you to capture something, it's nice to be able to have that focusing capabilities. On the Canon side of things, you've got nine points through the viewfinder. They're quite capable and it's good enough for most everyday stuff. It wouldn't be my pick for more action-oriented photography, birds in flight or sports. Uh, and when you switch to the LCD on the back, you move into a different focusing system. And for action, it is much slower, both focusing and the frame rate that it can achieve when it's continually autofocusing. So it certainly wouldn't be my pick in that case for any kind of action. Now, one benefit though that that Canon has between the touchscreen and the autofocus system is when you switch over to video. That dual pixel autofocus is so nice, smooth, and easy to work with that it really does pretty much blow all other systems out of the water. Shooting video with this camera is just a wonderful experience. The fully articulating screen, the touch to focus, and combine that with that dual pixel autofocus system makes capturing these kind of cinematic videos very easy and it's just kind of a friendly system to work with. It is limited though, just 1080 at 60 frames per second, but I find that excusable at this price point. I mean, you know, this is a kind of entry level camera, although we can find some entry level cameras that have 4K, they don't offer all of the kind of bells and whistles and huge ecosystem that Canon does. So I'm okay with no 4K in here and 1080 at 60 frames per second looks good and gives you kind of that option of making that cinematic slow-mo video. So we're ready to wrap this review up and I didn't talk about image quality or video quality and the difference is subtle. It, the, the Sony has an advantage, especially in lower light, but the difference isn't huge and really with any of these cameras you can make fantastic beautiful pictures and video. Really where the Canon has the edge is the ease of use, that fully articulating screen that's touch enabled, that dual pixel autofocus for easy video and in live view, touch to focus, all kind of combine along with that user interface that's been redesigned to present to you a camera that's quite friendly and easy to use. And I think that will encourage you to pick it up and take it with you places. And the Sony is smaller and lighter. And so if that's important to you, then that would be the camera I would pick. But it's certainly, you're gonna to have to recognize that it's gonna take a little bit more time to use and to learn, and ultimately can give you better images, but only if you take that time to use it and learn it, and of course, take it with you like any of these cameras. I'd love to know which one you would pick, and if you'd like to see full resolution RAWs and video samples, those are linked right down below this video, as well as links to buy your purchase of these cameras through those links. Cost you nothing extra, and really does help support what we do here at Photorec.tv. I so appreciate you watching this. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe for more videos, reviews, tips, and tricks, all coming soon. Thanks so much for watching. Bye-bye.